New York as a powerhouse that he's made things grow wherever he's been. And uh, when he came here before then, when he was here with NCSY, it was very exciting to see. Um, we had a youth group here of NCSY and it went from Vancouver to Seattle to Portland, Edmonton, I think in Calgary. And um, I am one of the original NCSY members uh, from Shared Zedek. Uh, at that time, there was probably five of us at the beginning. And so uh, it was great to see it grow. And when Rabbi um, Berman was finished, there were 1,500, from 30 to 1,500 in the West Pacific West and Northwest. And so uh, you can see uh, Rabbi Berg from um, New York, who's in charge of NCSY nationally, he said that Rabbi Berman was a powerhouse. So I'm very happy to have our powerhouse back in bank on Zoom so that we can talk to him. And uh, with, I guess without much more to say, uh, you need to know that Rabbi Bergen Berman is the regional director or the director of OU Israel. And um, he's a sought, well sought after speaker and educator. Um, he has many speaking engagements in the Israeli Knesset on Israeli media. And he has a weekly radio show with Galei Israel for 11 years now. And um, I'm going to turn this over to Rabbi Berman because you really don't want to hear from me. So Rabbi Berman, it's all yours. <laughs> Thank you so much, Eileen. Thank you, uh, Rabbi Federgrun. Uh, and um, all I could tell you is that it is um, really special seeing uh, all of you, even though it's uh, via camera and uh, very distant uh, physically. I feel very close emotionally, uh, flipping through the uh, pictures here of, uh, and names of people that are so dear to me, people that get mazel tovs now and people that are you know, moving on in their life. And uh, it, it's just so, so wonderful to see, uh, see all of you here. Um, I have the honor of being in touch with so many of you uh, till today. Um, and I, I want to start off by, uh, by really saying thank you. Uh, I assume that uh, many of you heard that uh, I was in need of uh, some prayers. And uh, Baruch Hashem, I could tell you that uh, your, your prayers were heard by God all the way from Vancouver. And uh, they worked. And I'm standing here in front of you. And Baruch Hashem, strong and running forward and uh, back to the office. And uh, thank God, doing great. So uh, really, thank you very much for all your uh, prayers and Bezat Hashem. We will uh, see you guys in person very soon. Um, today, we're, uh, we're going to be talking about something very exciting, something that for, for each and every one of us means a tremendous amount. I think when Yom Ha'atzmaut comes along and we see that uh, Israeli flag hanging, whether it's uh, you know, uh, next to this uh, shul or next to the uh, Federation building or next to the JCC or uh, where, wherever we walk inside the Jewish community in Vancouver, uh, or we flip on the TV and suddenly we see, uh, you know, videos coming from Israel or, or, or celebrations in Israel. There's something about that Israeli flag that means a tremendous amount to us, whether we're living in Israel or we're not. There's something special about, you know, uh, when I send pictures of my kids to uh, people around the world uh, uh, that I'm friendly with, they're like, oh, wow, that's amazing. And uh, this past year, when I send a picture of my kids and one of them happens to be in uniform, suddenly it takes an entire different twist and it gives each and every one of us a tremendous amount of pride and, 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 and you know, security, knowing that uh, we have a homeland, we have the state of Israel, whether we choose to live in it right now or we choose not to live in it right now, I think all of us are associated with Israel, we all care about Israel, we're all praying for Israel, we're all giving to Israel, we're all helping Israel in every way possible. And What's fascinating is that what we're going to be seeing in the next uh, 45 minutes is what I, was, what I was told, is ultimately promises that came from uh, God Almighty. Uh, he had uh, many messengers, that he would call them prophets, we call them Nevi'im, from, from Moses to Joshua to Jeremiah to Zechariah. Uh, each and every one of them came and gave a, uh, you know, different prophecies. Um, and these prophecies were given during times when, when, when people thought they were crazy. When people saw, saw Yerushalayim going up in flames and, and, and the people of Jerusalem being slaughtered and, and destroyed, 
and, and Jeremiah stands there and he sees the temple in ruins and, and foxes walking through the, the temple. And he looks up and he says the prophecies of, don't worry, we will see the days where we're going to have grandparents sitting with their grandchildren in the streets of Yerushalayim. And they're going to be playing on the uh, swing set and they're going to be, uh, you know, going to laser tag together and they're going to go and, you know, go ice skating together and, uh, you know, they're going to have fun together. Uh, everybody thought he was crazy. Everybody thought he was nuts. And it, it took a real lunatic or a prophet to be able to stand up and say these prophecies so many years ago. So what we're going to do is we're going to look through a number of prophecies. I put together a, a, a book that's based on my radio show. My radio show is, uh, as I said, as Eileen said, we've been going 11 years strong. And the goal of the radio show is just to talk about what is positive in Israel. What are the great things that are happening here in Israel? Uh, generally speaking, I don't know if you know this about Jews, but we like to complain. So normal radio shows in Israel are generally speaking, uh, complaining about, uh, you know, uh, you know, who's prime minister and who's not prime minister and, uh, you know, why the price is so high and why the price is so low. And no matter what happens, Jews have to complain. Uh, you know, the three bubbies that sit down and uh, they all uh, want to say what's on their mind and oh, 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 and they all decide, oh, we're not talking about our kids now, right? So it's, you know, at the end of the day, it, uh, it, it is in our Jewish gene to uh, complain. So our, uh, our radio show is really to come and bring a completely different light. And that is to show the great things that are happening in Israel. So we put together uh, a, a book of about uh, 300 pages. I tried to summarize it down to about 60 slides that we're going to go through today that really bring in, in graphs and statistics uh, the different prophecies that we uh, are going to see. I'm going to be uh, sharing my desktop right now so uh, that everybody could uh, see the slides. If you see the slides, and that's great. Do you see them? You see him now? Okay, great. So uh, ultimately, the, the book that we uh, that we put together is called Hanavua. Very simple. Hanavua means prophecy, and uh, the goal of uh, the book was really to give uh, uh, some light on what's happening in the state of Israel today. And uh, God willing, we will be going through this, and uh, we will uh, leave this talk in about uh, fifty minutes uh, with a different understanding of Israel. So first of all, it's important to understand that uh, the, the, uh, in the last century, the Jewish people have undergone more changes than the previous 19 centuries. In other words, if we were to try to think about, you know, take a day that's more very meaningful to each and every one of us. Take the day of Tisha B'Av, okay? And let's try to think about Tisha B'Av about 2,000 years ago. So there were some people that still remember the destruction of the temple. They were sitting on the floor and trying to explain to their children what the temple was really all about. Let's follow that 200 years. So we're talking 1800 years ago. People are sitting on the floor in Tisha B'Av. They're reading Eicha. They're, they're mourning. They're reading the keynote, etc. And they're trying to explain what they heard from their great, great, great grandparents of what the temple was like. But ultimately, from 1800 years ago until ultimately about 200 years ago, 150 years ago, there's really no change in the way we kept Tisha B'Av and in any movement that took place or, or practically didn't take place as far as the Jewish people returning home, as far as the Jewish people starting to see some light that there's going to be an end, an end to exile, that there's going to be the Jewish people coming back to the land of Israel, that, like I said, where we're, where we're promised that we're going to be playing uh, on the swing set with our grandchildren, it stays as some dream that we're staying, saying three times a, a day in our prayers, but, but not much more than that. And the Jewish people, what's beautiful about the Jewish people is that we continue on with that belief. And we go on century after century after century believing that one day we're going to come back to the land of Israel and one day Israel's going to stop blossoming again and one day the Jewish people are going to be returning to the land of Israel, etc. And, you know, for, for, for many years, uh, it, it seemed as a dream and for, for the first time, we're able to see the, that dream come true. So this is uh, 
just one of the prophecies in in uh, in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy uh, Devarim. Then the Almighty, your God, will return you for you from exile and show you the merciful kindness. He will gather you again from among all the nations where the Almighty is. He, he took us all over the world. The Jews came back to the land of Israel from 102 different countries. 102 different countries. You know, we talk about the fact that we just sat at the Seder. And uh, I'm sure we all had meaningful uh, Seders. And we're all talking about the fact that we left Egypt. And what a great miracle it was that we left from Egypt and came to Israel. Well, let's think about it. What's harder? Bringing the Jewish people from the closest country to, from, to Israel, which is Egypt, as one people, as one cohesive group to Israel, or bring the Jewish people back from 102 different countries? Is it easier to bring people back from, Israel, from Egypt to Israel, where everybody's speaking the same language and just bring them back to Israel? Everybody has the same culture? Or is it harder to bring back people from 102 different countries with 102 different cultures and 102 different languages? So ultimately, we are seeing a, a, a tremendous miracle happening today. And it's, it, it's not just uh, in Deuteronomy that we see that prophecy. We see Isaiah, we see Jeremiah, we see Ezekiel, we see Micah, and we see Zechariah, all talking about that, about that prophecy. And all in times when it was just absolute disbelief. Like, how could you possibly come and say that we are going to be coming back from the exiles and we're going to have hope and we're going to be walking the streets of Jerusalem and we're going to be uh, blossoming the land and we're going to be uh, bringing many children into the world. And I, people are, I, I, you know, the, the, the strongest uh, um, uh, armies of the world that just disperse the Jewish people around the world. And you're coming and talking about times, they would have put, in, put them in an insane asylum if they, were, if they could have. But there are, the prophets continued saying God's word, and we're going to see the results very soon. So this is a graph showing the year of 1917. Okay, By 1880, the number of Jews in the land of Israel grew to 24,000, some three and a half times more than the number since the destruction of the temple, second temple. Okay, So 24,000. And that is three and a half times the amount of uh, for, since the destruction of the temple. Okay. And the prophecy in Isaiah, and you will be gathered up one by one, O children of Israel. Okay. These numbers are based on the statistics of 2017, the Statistic Bureau of the State of Israel. Okay. 71% of the uh, Jewish people in 1917 were in Europe and Russia, 22% were in North America. 5.6% were in Asia, Africa, and Turkey. I'm missing an E there. 1.3% were in South America, Australia, and South Africa. And 0.4% of the Jewish people were in the state of Israel. Ready? 2019. 7.9% are in Europe and Russia. 42.7% are in North America. 06 in Asia, Africa, and Turkey. 1.8 in South America, Australia, and South Africa, and 40, almost 47% of the Jews are in the state of Israel. So let's, let's remember, okay, for 18, 1900 years, okay, we grew by, remember the number? 24,000 with three and a half times the amount. Look what happened in the last 100 years. We went from being 0.4% of the Jewish people in Israel to being 47%. And the number is higher. These are 2019 numbers. The number has got, have, have gone even higher. Now, if you look over here, the Jewish population in the state of Israel, look at, look at the, uh, the, the jump from 1948 to 1950 to 1970. No, it starts growing already in 1882 to 1900 to 1914 to 1917. There's a certain amount to jump. You, know, there's, you could even see from 1882 to 1917, it jumps more than doubles or doubles. Um, but afterwards, it uh, literally starts quadrupling and, and, and ten tenfold, etc. Until now, we're about 7 million Jews in the land of, in, in the land of Israel, which is, which is absolutely remarkable. When you look at uh, when you look at the trends in the world and how you move populations from one place to the other, especially as I said before, that you collect them from 102 different countries around the world. 
the Jewish people in exile, the Jewish, uh, Jewish survival through 1900 years of exile and assistant attempts to wipe us out of the unparalleled history wonder. It's an absolute miracle that we're able to stand here in the land of Israel and know that so many nations and so many countries tried to destroy the Jewish people. Yes, we had those that tried to help us, but over the 1900 years, we had many, many nations that tried to destroy us. And Baruch Hashem, today we're able to look at, at a Jewish Israeli soldier and stand with a tremendous amount of pride and say, thank you, Hashem. What's fascinating is that when you look at malaria and other diseases, left the land desolate, okay? The, the, uh, the uh, prophets promise us that while the Jews are not in the land of Israel, nobody else will come and take over the land of Israel. And what's fascinating is that for literally from the second to the, from the destruction of the second temple until literally a hundred years ago, a little uh, less than a hundred years ago, the state of Israel was protected by literally mosquitoes and malaria. Look at the maps, how literally uh, identical they are to where the Jewish people came back to, to where the diseases were. It, it's just f fascinating. It's, I read a whole book on this. It's, it's, it's really incredible. This is Amos. A time is coming, declares God, when the plowman shall meet the reaper and the treater of, uh, of, gra uh, of grapes him who holds the bag of seed, when the mountain shall drip wine, and the hills shall wave with grain. It, it, it is remarkable to drive through the land of Israel today. I mean, I'm sure you've all seen it on JNF videos, and I'm sure you've all seen it on many, you know, incredible videos that are being taken from above of Israel. Seeing what's happening in Israel and seeing the growth uh, of, of the harvesting, the grapes, the, the, the wheat, the, the fruits, the vegetables. I mean, you walk through Machane Yehuda uh, in Yerushalayim, where, which is the, the uh, fruit market. And, and it's just remarkable to see the, uh, the uh, fruits and vegetables that, uh, that uh, are growing in the land of Israel. Well, over here, I'm going to show the bounty of agriculture, Israel versus world yield, yield okay? So, the, the two graphs, one is from 1961 to 1969, and the second one is from 2004 to 2014. Yes, I realize it's written backwards. Um, so the orange is ultimately how, much is, how many tons are growing per dunam of land. Okay, you're Canadian, so you should know what dunams are, right? Okay, you're not going bakers there, right? So per dunam of land, how many tons are growing? So already in 1961 to 1969, we see that there's a much greater growth in Israel versus the rest of the world. If you compare 2004 to 2014, we're well, literally almost three times the amount of yield. Okay, but let's try to go down into detail of which, uh, which crops are growing and which crops are growing more per duna. Okay, so if you look at tomatoes, for example, okay, the average in the world is 40 for every uh, 40 tons for every dunam, okay? In Israel, it's literally almost double. Carrots, cucumbers, peppers, strawberries, pumpkins, potatoes, corn, onions, seeds, etc. cetera. It, it just goes on and on showing how literally the land of Israel, you're not talking about, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, um, Israel's technology being better, where, oh, we have a better mind. Over here, we're literally talking about a dunam of land here, a dunam of land in the rest of the world, where it's yielding more, okay? And uh, thank God we see the tremendous blessing in the land of Israel, and that literally is God's promise that when you come back to the land of Israel, it will stop being a decimate land, like Mark Twain testified to the fact to when he was here 150 years ago, uh, and it's going to stop blossoming again. Here's something that you really can't, can't but be blown away about, okay? And this is the fact that when you take a average cow, okay, you ready? Um, I know we have some people that are in the group here that deal a lot with cows. So uh, when, we, uh, when we look at the average cow and how many liters of milk it gives in Israel versus every other country in the world, okay? I apologize. 
but I just am realizing now that we didn't translate the names of the countries into English. So I'm going to read them to you, okay? So it starts with, uh, one second, I believe it's Turkey is the 3,162. Second. Then New Zealand is 4,151 liters of milk per cow per year, okay? Croatia, 4,394. Ireland, 5,349. Chile, South Africa, Slovenia, Tunis, Poland, Latvia, Switzerland. We're not talking about countries that don't have, you know, greenery. Slovakia, uh, Germany, United States, and Israel. And I want you to know the number is already at 12,900, okay? Since this graph was done in 2018. So it's already gone much higher than, uh, than uh, even in this graph. Now, how do you explain that? How do you explain that, a, that a, a cow is giving more milk in Israel versus every other country in the world? Unless you look inside the Torah and you see Eretz Zavat Chalav Udvash. It's a land that is flowing with milk and honey. There's no other way to explain it. There's no way that Israel has better technology in how to milk a cow or what to feed a cow than the United States of America or Germany. But why is Germany at 7,980 and Israel's at 12,900? And, and, and these are hard facts, not in fact numbers. Israel's use of water in the most is the most productive in the world, okay? Over here you see a graph basically showing um, how based on the uh, years that are coming along, the uh, the amount of water that we're able to uh, get directly to the uh, to the uh, fields is uh, is uh, ultimately we're utilizing the water better than any other countries in the world, and that's after Israel is already taking uh, irrigation systems and, and dripping systems, etc., and shared it with, literally with around the world. Okay, here you see a picture of the drip drip irrigation. Uh, and, uh, you know, th thank God, I'm, I'm proud to say that, that the impact that Israel is having on, uh, on Africa, having on California, uh, and, and many other deserts around the world is, is just remarkable in how we're able to get them fresh water and how we're able to get them uh, uh, plants that will grow in deserts because of these uh, incredible systems that we've developed. We put together, uh, you know, Seth Siegel put together a, a book that... Uh, let There Be Water, phenomenal book. I recommend everybody read it. Uh, really how, how Israel changed uh, uh, the water problem of the world and how uh, every country literally could, uh, could uh, utilize fresh water and be able to plant whatever they want around the world. Uh, the fact that uh, Israel today, you know, for years and years, I remember sitting in, uh, in Shari Tzedek and uh, hearing Ben Dason, all of a shalom, get up on Yom Kippur and talk about the fact that uh, JNF is still saying that the biggest problem that Israel has is water and we need to build more reservoirs and uh, etc. And uh, today Israel is literally the leading country in the world in uh, wa seawater desalination. Uh, and um, uh, you know we still are very excited whenever it rains here in Israel. We're still very excited whenever the Kinneret is up. I mean you could ask me without, uh, at, the, at a drop of a pin, I could tell you the fact that uh, we're still missing 36 centimeters for the Kinara to be full. Uh, it's, it's beautiful, it's remarkable, it's exciting. Uh, they're about to open the Daganya um, um, Dam. And, uh, you know, it's, it's very exciting when we get water from God here and that it's uh, coming down in a natural way. But uh, ultimately, we're able to make sure that even though the uh, um, amount, of, in, amount of water in the Kinneret is pretty much the same over the years, uh, because Israel is growing dramatically and we have many more mouths to, uh, that need to drink and many more bodies that need to be showered, uh, we needed to you know, come up with a, a fast and real solution uh, to make sure that the state of Israel has enough, uh, has enough water. And therefore the seawater desalination really was a tremendous solution and uh, got us all uh, to be able to shower, you know, an extra minute without uh, feeling guilty about it. Uh, water recycling, okay? 
the amount of uh, water that's being recycled around the world. The country that comes closest to Israel is Spain. They recycle 17% of their water. In Israel, we recycle 86% of all our water that is becoming what, what we call here gray water, and that is going and watering all our uh, crops and all our fields, etc. cetera. It's, uh, it's pretty much almost the highest it can get to uh, because the other 14% are just full with, with, with so many uh, uh, minerals and uh, negative minerals, et cetera, that, that, that just can't be get out. We probably get up to 90%, but we're, we're already at 86%, which is absolutely remarkable, uh, especially when you can, can compare it to the countries around the world. Summing it up, uh, I, I welcome you all to, uh, to read what uh, Ezekiel uh, tells us, but ultimately he's uh, making sure we're going to uh, realize that when we come back to the land of Israel, the, the, the land is going to stop blossoming. You know, this is a, a picture of uh, Emek Israel, the Galil, where you start seeing Baruch Hashem, the, uh, re, uh, the replanting of, of uh, uh, grape vineyards, uh, incredible wine that's coming out of the uh, land of Israel. I know that uh, you go to the BC liquor shops and you can pick up some of the Israeli great wine, uh, make sure it has the OU, okay? Uh, but, um, you know, it's really, uh, it's really remarkable to see uh, how Israel is blossoming. Uh, the uh, Gemara and uh, Tractate uh, Sanhedrin tells us that uh, there, the, the question comes up there in the Gemara. And uh, the question is, how are we going to know that the times have come for, for the Messiah to come? And uh, the answer that the Gemara gives is that you will have no more explicit manifestation of the end of times than when you're able to see all the fruits of, uh, fruits growing on the trees once again in the land of Israel. And I think that uh, we all could walk through Machane Yehuda, we could all walk through any um, literally field in the state of Israel and see uh, the incredible blossoming that is happening, uh, that is happening here. Um, here is uh, ultimately a promise that we get from, from Joshua, that ultimately that uh, we're going to be standing up against our enemies, not going to be easy, but uh, we're going to reach a stage where we're going to have a, 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 a thousand uh, enemies run away from, uh, from five of us. Um, this is a cute picture I put in here because it's, uh, you know, back in, uh, in uh, the first years of the state of Israel, where they're, they put up in, in Tel Aviv, asking people between the ages of 17 and 25 to please come and line up uh, for the security of the nation. We need you to please come and join the, uh, the uh, army, the, uh, the IDF, in order to protect the state of Israel. And this is literally seven, less than 70 years ago when we were begging for 17 to 25 year olds to join the, uh, join the IDF. Um, and this is just comparing where Israel was uh, during a number of our wars. So if we look at the Six Day War, we had in Israel, we had 800 tanks versus 2,500 tanks uh, of our uh, enemy countries around us. Uh, we had 196 planes. Needless to tell you that they were not in the best of shapes, but uh, thank God we had some planes then compared to 857 of our enemies, and we had, uh, uh, sorry, this, this is exactly reversed. We had 547,000 uh, soldiers. No, it was 96,000, this, this four is a mistake. We had 96,000 soldiers versus 547,000 uh, of, uh, of our enemies. And the, uh, the losses during the course of the Six Day War, Israel lost 46 planes, our enemies lost 541 planes. In captivities, we unfortunately had 15 soldiers in captivity. They had 6,000. We unfortunately had 2,593 casualties in the Six Day War, and they had 45,000, uh, sorry, injuries. And then dead, we had 779, and they had 21,500. So uh, um, even the wars, we see uh, tremendous victories, which really makes no sense whatsoever. But that's no, uh, nothing new to anybody that lived during that time. The Yom Kippur War, once again, the amount of artillery that we had, the amount of tanks that we had versus theirs, the airplanes that we had versus theirs, and the amount of soldiers that we had versus uh, the amount of soldiers that they had. 
They had you know, close to 850,000 uh, soldiers. We had 373,000. Uh, needless to say that uh, they had many more years of training than, uh, than our soldiers. And uh, these are the losses during the Yom Kippur War. We lost 407 tanks. They lost 2,250. We lost 101 airplanes. They lost 555. We had 294 in captivity. They had, th they had 8,800. We had 7,250 casualties versus uh, 35,000 of theirs. And we unfortunately, like we all know, we lost 2,222 uh, of our soldiers in the Yom Kippur War, and they lost uh, 20,000. Um, this is an incredible picture that I like to like to put in here because the, the U.S. was in shock when they heard that we're still using the Sherman tank that was leftovers from the uh, Second World War. Uh, we were using that as our number one tank in the uh, Yom Kippur War. So uh, I like keeping that in there just to, when we talk about how many tanks Israel had, just to realize what we were still fighting with, even though it was uh, 30 years after the... Uh, um, after the Second World War. What you see in front of you is, is, is a very meaningful picture. It's a picture of an arrow. Um, ultimately, what, what, I, what I'm going to tell you is, is, is remarkable and I'm telling you from firsthand. Uh, a close relative of mine happens to have been the, uh, in, in charge of the uh, um, Missile Defense Force of the State of Israel. Um, uh, he was the one standing in front of the Pentagon and, and, and preaching to those uh, sitting there, generals, etc., about why to support Israel, uh, Israel's initiative in um, uh, trying to develop the Arrow missile, uh, as well as the uh, Iron Dome, etc. And uh, we're going to see uh, a, number, a number of different pictures here. But it's, it's important to remember that Israel has enemies from many different distances. You know, the one we're hearing about now is, is Iran. Uh, the one we hear about almost constantly is, is Gaza, uh, is Hezbollah up north, is, is Syria. Um, and uh, when you look at the state of Israel, it's, it's, it's a very narrow, but very long state. And uh, the distances of our enemies to reach us uh, are, are very different. In other words, if, if we take, uh, um, take the U.S., okay? So the U.S. Uh, sees uh, North Korea as a threat of a, a country that threatens it, that it uh, will, will shoot a missile at it, but uh, <clears throat> ballistic missiles. But uh, ultimately, it's coming and saying, listen, uh, we have two places that ultimately could hit, either one of the uh, islands in the middle of the Pacific or the uh, uh, shores of the West Coast, uh, and the very similar distances. When we're talking about uh, Gaza shooting on Steirot, you're talking about a difference of a distance of five kilometers. When we're dealing with uh, Hezbollah up north, they could shoot anything from seven kilometers all the way to 450 kilometers. When we're talking about Iraq, right? Those of us that remember the, the Gulf War, uh, they were shooting missiles at Israel for about 250, 300 kilometers away from Israel. Uh, and when we're dealing with Iran, you're also talking about 700, uh, 700 uh, kilometers away from Israel. So ultimately, the distances in which Israel has to deal with uh, are, are very different. And therefore, Israel uh, had to invest a tremendous amount of time, effort, money and brain uh, in order to develop many different missiles in order to, the, to defend the state of Israel. So we're all very familiar with the Iron Dome, with uh, David Sling. Uh, and even the arrow, um, but the arrow one and arrow two, as well as the others, were built on a very simple system. Um, it's based on heat, so that a missile is coming in. There's, there's no doubt it takes tremendous you know, uh, intellect in order to figure out exactly how you're going to shoot the missile off the second it takes off, use the radars, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, ultimately, you know, who am I? I'm you know, just a rabbi coming and saying that the, the, the uh, technology that it takes in order to hit something hot in the air is pretty easy because the, 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 uh, the, uh, what, what attracts the missile, the defense missile, is ultimately it's open in the air and it just goes towards the most hottest thing there is. Uh, and that's how it takes down the missile. It just shoots the missile no matter where. 
uh, when it's going up, shoots it down and, and, and finished. And, you know, thank God it, it ultimately takes it down. But um, ultimately our, our, our biggest problem with um, missiles that are coming from further is the fact that those missiles have to go above atmosphere. And any missile that goes above atmosphere, we all know that there's no heat above atmosphere. So even if you're able to shoot a missile up in order to take down a missile that's above atmosphere, you can use the same technology in order to take down a missile. So my relative is standing and uh, speaking to the uh, uh, Pentagon and uh, three five-star generals are sitting there and listening to his presentation. And they say to him, uh, basically what you're telling me is that if you're gonna stand on one side of the room with Pentagon and I'm gonna stand on the other side and you're gonna pull out your gun and you're gonna shoot me, I'm gonna be able to pull out my gun, shoot back at you and hit the bullet head on. And that's what you're telling me you're gonna be able to develop in order to defend Israel. I don't believe it. And the little guy literally, my, my relative tells me, he says, Avi, he started laughing at me in my face and I'm standing there and I'm all red and I don't know what to say. I just look at him and said to and he said, I said to them, God has helped us till today develop. We think we know how to do it. I'm asking for the funding for another year. Please have, please have faith in us. And they all look at each other and they agree to give another year of, uh, of funding and uh, successfully they are able to develop the missile that was shot off not, not far from you in Alaska, just uh, about a year ago, about a year and a half ago. Um, and, um, you know, thanks to uh, uh, the American army and the Israeli army, we're able to, to successfully shoot down 10 out of 10 missiles that were taken off in Alaska above atmosphere. And um, when, I, when I talked to this relative of mine, his name is Shmuel, I said, Shmuel, tell me something, you know, how? He said, listen, Avi, there are seven plus billion people on the face of this planet. There's no logical explanation as to why one of the eight million people that are living in the state of Israel should be the one that ultimately is gonna be the one that's gonna be able to develop it. And if I don't look up and thank God, then I really have, no hakar satov. I really don't know how to thank those the, the one that gave me the the ability to do so. Um, again, you know, here are our different missiles. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about this one right over here, the the tank that you see on the left. Uh, and then we're going to start running faster because we still have a whole bunch of slides to do. But uh, because my son is in the tank division, they developed a, a system called uh, uh, Meil Ruach, which uh, is ultimately a wind jacket. It sits on the back of the tank and it's a little iron dome. And whenever a missile is shooting towards the tank, the, the people in the tank don't even realize it. But this little iron dome takes off, boom, shoots out the missile that is heading towards the uh, tank. And our soldiers could just continue driving through uh, enemy area. And uh, it, it, it literally is the most incredible, incredible miracle. And as a father of a, 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 a boy that literally is a, on the borders of Gaza, you got to uh, uh, thank God that uh, God gives us the developments and uh, uh, we have these uh, type of technologies, as you see, um, you know, many other vehicles that we can go, uh, can go through because we really have not much time, but we have to run. Uh, we're seeing a tremendous change uh, in uh, what's happening in the countries around us. Uh, the prophecy says, and I will have uh, Egypt fight, fight Egypt meaning the Arab countries around us. We saw it in Egypt, we saw it in Tunisia, Yemen, Syria, and all the countries around us, how they're busy fighting themselves and, and not dealing with the, uh, with the state of Israel. What's fascinating over here is to, to see a, a country like Israel uh, with economic strength. Um, uh, you compare Israel literally to the, to the, to the rest of the world uh, we're above Britain in GDP, we're above France, Japan, Italy, uh, yes, Norway, Canada, United States, Sweden, uh, and Germany is still above us, but um, I, I think that uh, we're doing pretty good for, for a small young country, 
uh, that uh, literally gathered in millions of people from around the world that came here, leaving all their belongings back in Europe or all their belongings back in Arab countries and starting out here literally with, with, with the shirt that was on their back uh, and how we were able to build up a, a GDP of $45,000 uh, per capita is, is really remarkable. Uh, this shows the, the um, uh, rate of economic growth uh, Israel versus the rest of the OECD countries, uh, specifically showing what, what has happened over the last, since 2006, uh, 2008, when the uh, world went through a crisis, uh, the, rest of the, the rest of the OECD countries somewhat have you know, uh, balanced out, uh, and, and Israel just kept on uh, uh, shooting up, which is, is really incredible, and you will be creditor to many nations, but debtor to none. Once again, a prophecy from, uh, from uh, Deuteronomy. Uh, I can't but mention the, the Bereshit uh, project. You know, we, we ended up crashing into the moon, but at least we got to the moon. And um, uh, uh, they're building Bereshit too. So uh, stay tuned for us to, to reach the moon very soon. Uh, Israel is number, number three in the world in high tech initiatives, surpassed only by the US and Switzerland. Um, it's, uh, you know, we can go hours and hours and hours and how each and every one of us is using Waze and how uh, every Intel computer and every Mac computer has, uh, you know, chips coming from Israel uh, and how uh, Mobileye is literally signed with almost every country besides Tesla uh, around the world and, and how to uh, create autonomic cars and that, you know, to prevent uh, um, uh, automobile accidents, etc. It's, uh, it's just really, uh, really incredible. According to World Bank's interna uh, International Research Index, is Israel leads the world by a wide margin in number of researchers per million, per million uh, residents, of course. Uh, for every million, we have 8,250 8, uh, researchers in Israel uh, versus, uh, versus literally look at the rest of the countries and, and, and how, how much Israel is investing in, in, in researchers versus the rest of the world. Uh, this is a value of Israeli companies in NASDAQ. Uh, I tried to get the number for 2020 where I know it's skyrocketed specifically in the last couple months. Uh, but, uh, but even looking at 2019, uh, Israel is, uh, is the largest company on Na largest country on NASDAQ, uh, aside from the United States. Um, this, is a, this is just a cute um, um, division of the Nobel Prizes in the world, okay? So if you look at the countries and nationalities, okay? It, all of them go by based on country, okay? Um, over here you have the Jews, which ultimately Jewish people have 201 Nobel Prizes in total. Uh, which is ultimately uh, a little less than a quarter of all the Nobel Prizes in the world. Um, really incredible for 14 million people. So uh, kudos to each and every one of you and each, one of, uh, and each and every one of us. Building the land. Um, we are going to come back to the land of Israel. Ezekiel promises us that we're going to start uh, uh, having children and uh, the, the animals are going to start uh, coming out again. And we're going to be able to resettle the land. Uh, that is what uh, Ezekiel uh, promises us. This is the number of residents in the Jewish cities in Israel uh, between 1914 and 2018. It's just, you look at Yerushalayim, you look at Tel Aviv, Tzfat, Netanya, Haifa, Petach Tikva. It's, uh, it's, it's really incredible to see, you know, cities like Petach Tikva go from 3,800 Jews all the way up to a quarter of a million Jews, or cities like Yerushalayim with 48,000 Jews go all the way up to over 900,000. Oh, nothing like Israeli water. Um, paving roads and, ro and Israeli railroads. Okay, believe it or not, uh, Yeshayahu, Isaiah, Isaiah, came out and said, guys, when the, land, when the Jews come back to the land of Israel, you're going to be paving roads and you're going to have solo, solo amesila. You're going to be having uh, tracks. Who then understood what tracks were? And uh, let's just look at numbers. Uh, in 1960, we had about uh, six and a half thousand kilometers of road, and now we're way above 20,000 uh, kilometers of road. These are the, uh, the rail system, the train system in Israel, uh, where in 2000, we're talking only 20 years ago, we had two, 201 different trains. 
Now we're up to um, almost three times that the amount of trains in Israel um, uh, every single day. Um, here is building up Yerushalayim. In 1920, we had 15,000 Jews in, in, in Yerushalayim, and now we have, Baruch Hashem, 920,000 Jews. It's just a beautiful picture from the Koto that I took. I was standing on the Asia Torah building, looking down. This is pre, pre-COVID, okay? Um, and uh, just seeing literally hundreds of thousands of Jews coming to the Kotel. This is uh, the night before, Yom, uh, night before Yom Kippur, everybody coming and praying. And uh, just, just beautiful seeing everybody coming together. This is uh, just a great picture of the Montefiore uh, windmill that uh, we're all familiar with. Um, you will plant vineyards in the hills of the Shomron once again. Uh, Jeremiah promised us, guys, don't worry, you're going to come back. I promise you, you're going to plant vineyards in the land of Israel. They're going to blossom. You're going to have more wine than you could possibly drink. And uh, um, this is literally what uh, what the Judea and Samaria lo- lo- look like today. Um, and, and these are numbers of the, the growth of the popul- population of Jews in Judea and Samaria literally since the Six-Day War. Uh, today we're at uh, roughly about uh, over 800,000 Jews living in Judea and Samaria, uh, which is uh, absolutely beautiful and remarkable seeing uh, uh, how Jews such as myself living in Givat Ze'ev and uh, settling the land and seeing how uh, the Jewish people are coming home. It's uh, really incredible. The, the birth rate uh, in Judea and Samaria, just, just for, your, for your information, uh, there's the, the Jewish birth rate versus the Arab uh, Muslim per- birth rate just in Judea and Samaria, um, uh, 4.87 versus 3.27. Um, and this is life expectancy uh, in Israel versus uh, countries around the world. Once again, a promise that when we come back to the land of Israel, uh, we will uh, start living longer and uh, Baruch Hashem, we see that. I apologize, we're running, but uh, we're just really uh, uh, short on time. This is a remarkable number of death of un- from unnatural causes uh, in Israel versus uh, the rest of the world. You would think with Israeli drivers and, and wars and, and terror, the number would be much higher, but uh, Baruch Hashem, um, uh, it's not, thank God. Uh, once again, I apologize here for not translating the rest of the uh, uh, countries into English, but um, uh, but I will bring healing to you and cure you from your wounds. Uh, There's the World Health Index. So this is Spain, Italy. I'm going from from the high to the low. Spain, Italy, Iceland, Japan, Switzerland, Sweden, Australia, Singapore, and Norway, uh, Israel, Luxembourg. France, Holland, Canada, uh, England, Germany, United States, and, uh, and on. Uh, this is quality of life, how people are happy, happy in Israel. I will turn them from mourning to joy. I will comfort them and cheer, cheer them with their grief. Uh, it, uh, Jeremiah says, it's not, it's not like we have easy lives, and unfortunately we go through many challenges. But uh, Baruch Hashem, when you look at the uh, quality of life, the world reported satisfaction and quality of life. Uh, you can see that Israel is literally right on the Finland, Switzerland, Canada. That's only because of Vancouver, literally only because of Vancouver. You like, you like take the numbers all the way up uh, for all of Canada. It's, it's not because of Toronto. Uh, Britain, Israel, uh, right afterwards. So, uh, uh, you know, I tell everybody, if you're not going to be in Vancouver, make sure to be in Israel. You'll be happy. Uh, this is the uh, fertility rate, um, w- which is actually remarkable. Okay, we're going to look over here for a second. Um, uh, what we're looking at over here are, are all Western countries. Okay, you're going to have higher birth rate in countries like Congo and, and, and other countries that literally uh, people are, are dying in the streets there and there's no medicine and no anything. Um, when we talk about westernized countries, uh, you look at the birth rate in South Korea, you look at the wor- birth rate in Spain, uh, even Germany, okay, uh, Canada. Um, in order to, uh, re- the replacement factor, in order to replace your population, you ultimately need 2.1 uh, births for every woman. Okay, that's just, just, just a fact because you have some natural, natural deaths, et cetera, et cetera. So you need 2.1 in order to just keep, keep yourselves at the number that you're at right now. 
Uh, Japan, for example, has a minister. His job is just to dismantle cities. Um, and um, you, you look at the birth rate around the world and you look at the promise from God that we will, have, we will be fruit, fruitful and multiply when we come to the land of Israel. And um, uh, you see Israel is at 3.16, which is higher than any other Western country in the world. When you look at the number of Judea and Samaria, like I said before, it's uh, even 4.87. And then there's one city in Israel that's called Modi'in Elite, Kiryat Sefer. Their average is 7.7, which is literally a world record uh, in uh, amount of babies per uh, what you call it. I thought I had nine and that uh, up the average, but uh, evidently though there are many other, many others that are doing much more than I do. So um, this is very apropos. I put this in uh, way before uh, I had to uh, um, um, have an operation, have a kidney taken out of me. But uh, Israel literally last week um, had, its for, uh, had its 1,000th altruistic donation of a kidney. Um, there's no other country that comes close to Israel. Uh, this is a gathering, uh, a Shabbat that they all had together of all the people that donated a kidney. Um, literally heroes to people that they have no idea who they are, whether they're Jewish or not Jewish. They know the residents of Israel, uh, but they decided to donate a kidney. I could tell you that the operation is painful. I could tell you that the operation is, is not fun. It's a, a scary moment, um, but uh, it, it's really remarkable in seeing, uh, seeing how many uh, Jews are there caring about each other and making sure that, uh, that other Jews are, are able to continue, continue on. And again, we, you know, nation of, of, of charity, uh, the biggest bone uh, marrow uh, donation uh, donors in the world, uh, the, the largest pool population, youngest pool donors in the world, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I, I know time is short, so we, we can't go much longer, but uh, this is just the uh, map of the, uh, Israel's diplomatic relationships around the world. This map is before our last four peace treaties with the UAE, Morocco, et cetera, but it, it already is very, very remarkable. Uh, you know, world leaders coming and uh, apologizing for what they did uh, what they did to the Jewish people. They don't ever make up anything, but definitely uh, does something. Uh, and again, those are prophecies. And over here we see Gentiles from around the world coming and volunteering on the uh, fields of Israel fields of Israel and helping with uh, with the uh, the growing of the flocks and growing of the uh, of the uh, uh, yards. And once again, we're going to end off with another prophecy of uh, if uh, God prom promised and uh, that certain prophecies will come true. And he started, uh, you know, with so many of them, he's definitely not going to stop in the middle. So I look forward to seeing all of you. Um, and together we should continue viewing the rest of the prophecies come true. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rabbi Berman. Uh, we've really enjoyed this. And I like the idea of seeing all these prophecies coming true living in Israel. I would also like to thank Anita and Arnold Silber for sponsoring our speaker series. Um, it's very nice that we can carry on and keep having these speakers and particularly having you. May you all be well. And like you say, we should all be meet together again someday soon in Yerushalayim. Amen. Yeah. Uh, if anyone wanted to, do, to ask questions, etc., yep. feel free. I, I don't know what your time limit is. I, I'm, I'm good for another 10, 15 minutes. Anybody have any questions? Please put it in the chat room. And the answer is no. I don't wear a suit and tie in Israel every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think uh, I think that's about it. And thank you, Rabbi Berman and Eileen Joe. Uh, well, thank you everyone for that presentation. And I wish everybody a good day and a reminder about the Shalhada Gala later today at seven o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Great seeing all your beautiful Bye. faces. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.